there, there is this idea, this too big to fail idea. We saw it in the financial crisis when, you know, just before these banks were held, were, were, were bailed out, they all had investment grade ratings. They, the, the, the rating agencies knew they were going to get bailed out. And so this thinking permeates mm -hmm. their, their, their credit process. And what it creates at investors is this idea that not that we have to understand what's going on with these institutions, we have to make sure we keep understanding mm -hmm. which institutions are too big to fail. And so it sort of divorces this, the, 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 the credit process right. away from actually looking at credit metrics. And it becomes this sort of game of like, okay, which institution today is so systemically important that if there's a crisis, it's it's going to be fine because the 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 uh, government's going to bail them out. I think that 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 has it does raise a number of issues, and particularly the issue that you raised about moral hazard. It does change the calculus of moral hazard, and it provides a safe haven for larger uh, larger financial institutions that isn't accorded to the other, you know, 7,000 financial institutions who live and die by the decisions they make. This is Rob Johnson, president of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with Jim Nadler. He's the co-founder and chief executive of KBRA Bond Rating Agency. Prior to today, we'd had some lovely discussions about all of the challenges that we face in the realm of credit, municipal bonds, educational institutions, and the whole, which you might call, spectrum of things that fall under the umbrella that people are rising to explore now called ESG, Environmental Social Responsibility and Governance. Jim, thanks for joining me. Thanks, Rob. It's great to be here. So let, let's start with big picture. I'm talking to you about public policy, but you're also a person who's serving clients, investors, trying to keep them from losing money. We all know we're in a world of change. I, I make a joke that uh, the pandemic is what really unmasked us in terms of the need for transition in our social philosophies, designs, and, and implementation. But you see this very clearly from our previous conversations. And how do you see your role in society as a new and innovative rating agency? Uh, thanks for that, Rob. It, that's, it's a great question because it is, it, you know, rating agencies historically have been viewed as a protection, protecting investors. And that is our number one priority. That is why we're in business. It's a raison mm -hmm. d'etre. But we have another role and that is to facilitate commerce. And I like to say that the, the reason that rating agencies are in that role is a little bit like why we put brakes on cars. You don't put brakes on cars so they can go slow. You put brakes on cars so they can go faster. Mm -hmm. And it's our job to make sure that the investors know that the brakes work, that the brakes are there and that there's someone always fine-tuning the brakes. And one of the things that the great financial recession of 2006, 2007 uh, showed us was that the, the two big monopolies that are in this space were asleep at the, at the wheel. And we were born out of that crisis, and our goal was to bring this new thinking, the landscape, the financial landscape is changing so rapidly. And you've got, you know, you've got this monopoly that is continually looking in the rearview mirror. And that isn't going to be, that's not going to do for investors the work that needs to be done going forward. You, we've got to be more nimble. The information landscape is changing so rapidly that you have to be part of that and part of that discussion to make sure that investors are being looked after and that they're getting the best possible information and, and protection. 
And so it's one of the reasons that we decided to, to build the bond rating agency. It's one of the reasons we've been successful. And it's really the mission that we're on to change the, this, this entire landscape. Let's talk about this new phenomenon I mentioned in the introduction, ESG investing. One of our board members, Jillian Tett from the Financial Times, now has uh, changed her presentation to what's called moral money. She's exploring the ESG environment uh, every week. But tell me how you see what it is, what the dangers are of a false consciousness and what its potential looks like. You know, the, 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 the really, so I'll start with the really positive aspect of ESG, and that is the awareness of ESG and its importance in I, just in the last, I would say, 12 to 18 months has increased dramatically. That alone is something that we should all be happy about. That, that, that you know, there have been people ever since uh, Rachel, I believe her name is Rachel Cohen, wrote uh, Silent Spring. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't think I got her name right, but ever since Silent Spring was written. It's Rachel, in the Rachel 60s, Carson is her name. Carson, Carson, sorry about that. Ever since Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring, there have been a number of activists in the environmental space. Uh, you know, we know about the, the social change that's gone on this in this country. Mm -hmm. It's been happening since the, you know, since the early beginnings of our country. But today, the awareness is broad and it's in it's on everybody's it's on everyone's plate everyone's looking at it. the downside is and you 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 raise this is that there are there there are people who are trying to take advantage of it there there there's this phenomenon known as greenwashing where it's just you know taking some old product you know putting a little green wrapper on it and getting investors to buy in to it being sort of this new type of security that's 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 green. I think that 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 we have to be careful about that. There are a number of what are called ESG ratings out out there and, and our competitors have their own ESG rating scales. I think those are those are very detrimental and I think they 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 stand to do a, an enormous amount of uh, of harm to the investing uh, community because they boil everything down to one number or one grade and the esg space is just not it's not built like that mm -hmm. there are so many nuances that come with each of the different disciplines whether it's environmental whether it's social responsibility or whether it's governance each of these disciplines are so vast and so nuanced that it's really requiring a, a, you know, a new way and a broader way of thinking. The last thing I'll say on the topic is that this new sort of awareness of ESG is great, but now the hard work begins. And that's what KBRA is all about. We are all about the hard work of ESG. It's why we're, develop, we're on a, a project to develop uh, how to think about carbon with respect to companies. You know, companies are afraid to talk about carbon publicly because they're afraid it's gonna be used against them by investors, by regulators, by taxing authorities. We've gotta find a way that companies are comfortable discussing carbon and how it's priced so that we can get a handle on it. We're working with community banks to help them find an effective and cost efficient way to disclose their carbon footprint to disclose some of the ESG attributes. And so, and this is hard work. This is not something that happens overnight. Um, and, and so we're committed to doing this hard work and we've got a lot of, you know, we've got a lot of hard work ahead of us in this, but it's our mission also to sort of get other people to start doing the hard work of yeah, ESG. So I come back to you from listening with two notions. One, is a famous old uh, notion in philosophy, abstraction enables cruelty, meaning it, it provides a mask <laughs> for, for yes, not doing. that's right. And the other is my dear friend, Charles Goodhart, who is a monetary 
economist at London School of Economics is now emeritus, and Goodhart's law was essentially any time you put some kind of measure or marker or rule in place, it starts to lose its power because people figure out how to work their way around it. So deep dive into the texture of understanding these things and understanding what you might call a map of what rules produce in behavior and what that does for the environment, I think is essential to making progress using the power and the energy of capital uh, around the world. You're, you're absolutely right, Rob. I think one of the things that we uh, realized early on, and it's why I spend so much time in Washington and why we spend time in Brussels, uh, is the regulatory environment around uh, ESG is going to be critical. And what we want is we want regulators to understand how nuanced each of these fields are so that we don't end up with regulation that causes unintended mm -hmm. consequences. And we, we, we end up with when regulators do come out with, you know, with regulations and with that these regulations are able to evolve because this area of ESG is growing it's changing. And so regulation, as well as credit analysis, has to yeah. keep up with it. And I, I would say, you know, to be really fair, this is, we're in the process of a learning curve. You're, you're taking a cutting edge role in protecting your investors as one part of the mission, contributing to, I would say, minimizing unnecessary losses from cumbersome how we say constraints on behavior, allocation of capital, and what have you, and but we're in a learning curve, just as in the technology sector. I thought I would think it would be terrifying to work at the Federal Trade Commission right now, unless you really knew tech inside out and how many people do. I mean, they know how to program, they know how to, you know, play with cryptocurrency or this or that. But how do you how do you govern something that? is so what you might call powerful but not yet completely understood and defined and and you got to be careful of weeding out the good while trying to protect from the bad and and i would imagine also in the realm of things like intellectual property rights market share and monopolies you're going to have guys on some side that are pretending something is bad because it would allow new entrance in that compresses their profit margin. We see that in the pharmaceutical uh, research and approvals. Uh, that lobbying is quite intense. I, I, you know, Rob, I think you've hit on a couple of really interesting points. I think that the, uh, the idea that the, 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 the you know, regulation uh, needs to not only incorporate the understanding of ESG, but understanding technology. Because today, the, the world of technology and the world of ESG are, are coming together in ways that are dramatic and in ways that are, that are speeding up the pace at which we get and, and, and analyze information in mm -hmm. the ESG space. And I think one of the biggest concerns uh, both from a regulatory standpoint, but also when I think about our, uh, you know, our our competitors who are much larger than we are, is that they are behind the eight ball; that they're not understanding how rapidly this intersection of of credit with respect to ESG and technology are are merging, and integrating that in the way that they evaluate what's going on in ESG. You know, the, just a small example, the technology today to understand, to look at a state and, and determine with heat maps where we're going to see the next problem with wildfires mm -hmm. is astonishing. And that technology is only getting better. Every, every time I meet with this company that's doing it, and there were several that are doing it, it's getting better and better. And so understanding that and understanding how to use that information and use that data productively, both from a, from a uh, rating standpoint, but also just 
w throughout the entire landscape of the financial sector so that all stakeholders understand it and are using it in a way that makes them more knowledgeable and yeah. helps them make better yeah. decisions. Well, I know a lot of people have used a lot of technology in that realm. For instance, uh, using online sites with photographs so, for instance, you can detect unrest in Baltimore, Maryland, about five days before it hits the newspapers. And uh, I know Palomir and other companies that have now worked closely with people like Bridgewater Capital are very good at uh, helping people see things sooner and, and more, how do you say, more accurately. I know years ago I was involved in a conversation right. with the Federal Reserve System about the aggregation of credit card data, things on Google's website and others, where you could discern the ebbs and flows in the economy all the way down to zip code. But you could aggregate it up to state, region, sector, what have you. And instead of the Federal Reserve waiting six weeks for an employment number to come out, 72 hours after the transactions occurred, they were much, right. how do you say, much more accurate and much more timely in, in helping in them the management of our macroeconomic society. So I think there's a lot of potential here. Right. But I also think there's something that's, that you alluded to uh, early on, the word monopolies. You know, habits are hard to break. And when you're profitable, perhaps for reasons that have less to do with your value added and more to do with your value extraction, it may be difficult to change your habits because if you can stay in the saddle, and just keep turning the crank and making money. That, that how did I say? It? That's very satisfying to some people. Yeah, I mean, you know, Moody's and S and P, even after the financial crisis, still have operating margins wow. in excess of fifty percent. Um, and today, their their stocks have a PE of over thirty. Uh, it, you know, it's a, it's astonishing, but it it's true. And what that what you just described, what that does is that uh, doesn't, uh, it, that's not a great environment for innovation and for changing the way that you do business. And we see that today in manifest itself in the way that they evaluate all sorts of, of uh, different types of assets. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples and then I'd love to talk more about the impact that is happening in municipals and large, you know, when you look at municipals as a whole, but mm -hmm. particularly in, in higher ed. Um, but a couple of great examples. Uh, when, I, when we started Kroll, we, uh, I've always been fascinated by uh, the bank, uh, the financial institution ratings at our two biggest competitors. They seem to be very size biased. They seem to Lot, you know, bigger banks get better ratings, and 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 there doesn't seem to be a lot of 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 uh, sort of uh, differentiation among the financial institutions. It really has a lot to do with size. It's correlated highly towards size. And what that evolved in over the years is that they they just had this notion that they didn't like, uh, you know, small regional banks and large community banks. Now. There are there are probably two thousand small banks that have uh, that have uh, you know assets under eight hundred million dollars. Those are never going to be investment grade. But there's a large segment of those banks, probably six, five or six hundred, four or five hundred, that uh, you know are, are are probably you know could could benefit from uh, a, a rating and particularly a smaller group that could benefit from an investment grade rating. And so we did a very large study that looked at how uh, financial institutions fared during the financial crisis. And what we found was antithetical to what was being done. We actually found that this mid-level of regional and community banks performed better than the larger banks that had to be bailed out during the financial crisis. And so we started rating these banks uh, investment grade, giving them access to cheaper capital, giving investors more uh, high quality rated paper that they could invest in. And what happened over time is that all of our competitors 
set up units to start raiding these mid-sized banks. Now, I, I assume they're using our research because I still haven't seen any research from them. But I think that that's one area where they, they were just set in their ways. And once they saw us doing it because it was a competitive issue, they started doing it. And so I do think we, we've been able to have a positive impact on the industry by being more forward thinking. And we've done this in a few areas. Airports is another one. Uh, they were sort of bound up in old criteria. We did new uh, new research and, and started rating airports. Now, I thought you find when you look at our competitors, they've all updated their criteria. But this is an issue that broadly impacts ratings generally, but it's partic particularly important in the municipal area where I think that that um, the the there, there's a there's a combination of things that are happening the landscape is changing very quickly esg is impacting these communities in ways that you know particularly if you are a community that is that may uh have to deal with changes in storm patterns or you're a community that is on the atlantic coast and you're worried about uh, uh rising sea levels or you're a community in uh, California, you're worried about forest fires. And so this that's just one example. So this is changing very quickly. And this antiquated thinking and antiquated way of looking at these type of bonds has a real impact, not only to investors, it could put them in jeopardy, could put them in, you know, their investments in, in harm. But it also, in some cases, like in the community bank uh, uh, illustration, could deny access to the capital markets to a group of, mm -hmm. of companies that really deserve that access to the capital market. And so, you know, we see this in a number of places. I think higher ed is a great example. I think particularly when you look at the historically black colleges and universities, um, that's an area where, you know, the criteria that was developed 40 years ago, even though you say to the world, yeah, we look at it every year and we rethink about it. Uh, if you're not really thinking about it in the context of today and the next 10 years, you're really doing a disservice to these these universities. And I know there have been several studies. We're actually in the middle of doing our own study, but I know there have been several studies that show that historically black colleges and universities mm -hmm. pay more in fees in the market, um, end up uh, spending, you know, their debt costs them more. And so I think that that's a huge red flag. And I think that, that a company like ours has a responsibility to not only our investors, but to those schools to make sure that they're treated fairly when they're when they are when their credit is assessed and that you you put them in the appropriate light so investors can make much more well I think I'm, decisions. You, you, how do I say triggering all kinds of things but the first one I want to say is that uh, they say that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery so when you got them to do the middle sized bench you should be grinning when you look in the mirror uh, say <laughs> <laughs> it, it does make me happy. I would say it waited yeah. a few years, but uh, but, but it, you know yeah. it does it does it does make yeah, me. The happy. second thing is I, I used to work with the United States Senate Banking Committee. Is I see this question of the large banks, which some call the too big to fail banks. Uh, it, it's difficult to rate them when you know that their scale and size means that if they fail, they can do so much damage to the real economy that they've almost taken what you might call the central bank's balance sheet prisoner. The contingent fiscal capacity of the United States is being reserved for those who can do harm in what some have called the mother of all moral hazards. And it's very tricky, I would think, from the standpoint of your business, thinking about the reaction function of bailouts in conjunction with what you might call the ratios and standalone integrity. Of, a, of an institution. But this moral hazard is very dangerous because what it does is it anesthetizes the credit default risk premium in the funding costs for the big banks. 
gives them a competitive advantage and they large enlarge market share and are able to take more risk. So I think I think it's a very, very complicated environment. I, I'm curious what your thoughts are. You know, I think you're, you you hit on a, a really, really interesting issue, and uh, and 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 this actually this issue yeah, that's cuts where I was back go next. to yeah. Howard University, and I, I'll I'll bring it back in a second. So uh, there there is this idea, this too big to fail idea. We saw it in the financial crisis when, you know, just before these banks were held were 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 bailed out, they all had investment grade ratings. They, the, the, the rating agencies knew they were going to get bailed out. And so this thinking permeates mm -hmm. their, their, their credit process. And what it creates at investors is this idea that not that we have to understand what's going on with these institutions. We have to make sure we keep understanding mm -hmm. which institutions are too big to fail. And so it sort of divorces this, the, 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 the credit process right. away from actually looking at credit metrics and it becomes this sort of game of why okay which institution today is so systemically important that if there's a crisis it's it's going to be fine because the 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 uh government's going to bail them out i think that 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 has it does raise a number of issues and particularly the issue that you raised about moral hazard, it does change the calculus of moral hazard, and it provides a safe haven for larger, uh, larger financial institutions that isn't accorded to the other, you know, seven thousand financial institutions who live and die by the decisions they make. Um, the 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 way that this this. The way this carries over to Howard is really interesting. So Howard is a federally uh, chartered uh, higher ed uh, school. Um, it clearly, clearly has the support of the federal government. It, they, 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 as much as every time it comes up, they've as much as said that. And so th it's interesting to me that I think one of the rating agencies has Howard below investment grade. So first of all, you think about, and, and I'm just using this as an example, but you think about how they have about a $700,000, $700 million endowment. Um, and yet being non-investment grade says that you have a 10% risk of default, 20% risk of default in the next five years. I don't think there's a person in, in any financial capacity, whether you're an investor or a banker, that thinks that Howard University mm -hmm. is going to be in default in the next five years. It's it's insanity. And so why that institution is so willing to apply the standard of too big to fail to an, an instant to a large financial institution, but is not willing no, to I'm not saying that's the right that's way right. to do it, but if you're doing it over here, mm -hmm. you should at least say, well, they're not going to let Howard fail either. Yeah, protections, so protection. they're at least investment grade in the way I look at yeah. them. And so protection is protection. And so you may disagree with it, but it's the reality of where we live. And so what I really find interesting is the despair, their willingness to, on the one hand, say, yeah, I believe the government's going to bail them out. But on the other hand, all evidence shows that it's true, but they're willing to say, but oh, no, no. You know, they've they've had a couple of management problems. They've had this problem, that problem. They're they're really they need to show us more before we're going to give them an investment grade. So I, that's I find what I find really interesting is this ability to uh, to separate to to uh, to compartmentalize the way yeah. they evaluate the, yeah. the governmental support. Uh, you either believe it or you don't. And so I find that the most interesting. Um, and, and it's specific to what we're talking about, uh, Rob, because it gets to the way that different institutions are viewed. And it's mm -hmm. probably has to do with the way they've been viewed yeah. historically. Let me ask you, because we um, talked about this that's once before, which change. was a large part of what inspired me to want to do this podcast with you. When you compare something like Howard, where the student body is African-American and 
just by the numbers, a lower height, a lower net worth group of people than what you might call high brand name liberal arts schools, places like Swarthmore, Haverford, uh, Middlebury, what have you. I'm not picking on any one in particular, but if you were to look at them blind, in other words, take away the name and look at them blind as, as ratios and balance sheets, Howard might stand up pretty well with that $700 million endowment. But there is some in, inference, perhaps, that's being drawn that yeah. the students will all need financial aid, so you're going to draw on that more at those colleges where places like Bowdoin, the student body is wealthy and will, which you might call, rally together, support the institution as alumni, not ever need to draw on financial aid. But th these are conjectures that I think, the, which you might call, they always said a bird in the hands were two in the bush. That money in that $700 million endowment should be raising their credit rating compared to ones with weaker ratios, and it's not happening. That's right, and I think you, you raise a couple of interesting points. So. The, the, the idea that it is somehow, uh, it's certainly from a, uh, you know, I'm not naive. It is from a, from a, uh, a uh, standpoint of preferability. Of course, it's great to have a, you know, if half your students are full pay, that changes the, imp you know, the amount of work that you have to do to raise financial aid for, for other students. And, but I think the way that we need to start looking at this is through a different lens. And that is that look at Howard's ability to raise this type of financial aid and still have an endowment that is $700 million. And the other thing that I think you, you raise, which is really interesting, is this idea of, uh, you know, this notion that, you know, if you're a small liberal arts school, predominantly white, uh, that you're going to be able to rally the parents, the alumni. Look at what's happened just recently with respect to Howard and their alumni. Uh, you know, the vice president is a Howard alum. Uh, Chadwick Boseman, uh, you know, one of the, one of the greatest mm -hmm. films that has been done in the last few years, Black Panther. He was a star. I mean, the 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 um, the sort of now recognition mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. Howard has these Roberta Flack incredible and alums Donnie and, Hathaway and, and, and the music world of the seventies were continued continued geniuses, and they were friends in yeah. Washington D.C. at Howard. The, exactly, and now. Now we need to change our view of that and say, oh, mm -hmm. well, they have the same type of alumni mm -hmm. and they're going to rally to their support. And they have rallied to their support when they've had problems. And so I think that this idea that, so you're exactly right. It's that we need to, um, I always love the, the story about the, uh, the, I forget which orchestra it was, uh, but they, weren't, they just weren't hiring women. And they finally um, put a screen up when people were auditioning. And lo and behold, they started hiring women. And what does that tell you? And so I think your example of let's take the names off of the universities and let's just show what's happening mm -hmm. in the numbers and start looking at it through that lens. And that's going to change the way that we evaluate um, evaluate uh, these uh, these institutions, and and just broadly speaking, it's going to be a much better analysis for investors yeah, well, some and for all affected those institutions. By, you know, inferences and conjectures and parables and stories, not just the raw science, but if you if you really narrow down the signal to noise ratio to the scientific measures. Right. You probably will, in this context, improve how you serve your customers, uh, the, meaning the investors who do place a bet. And right. I, I find, though, and you, as you know, I made a podcast recently we talked about with Destin Jenkins, a brilliant young historian from uh, University of Chicago's history department who did his Ph.D. dissertation 
on California in these municipal bonds and the what you might call distorted ways of measuring and handling things and the very painful contortions in urban cities. He, he obviously focused on San Francisco while he was at Stanford, but his insights into things like the Detroit bankruptcy of just a few years ago are extraordinary. So there are, there are a lot of ramifications here in uh, getting down to what I'll call that dispassionate science might make more sense. I had one question I wanted to ask you about Howard though. When Donald Trump was in the White House, people sensed that what you might call racial polarity and inclusiveness was on the decline. Did Howard's credit rating go down for fear that that support, that bailout money wouldn't be there in the Trump administration like it would be, say, in the Biden and uh, administration or in the Obama administration before that? Yeah. You know, Rob, that is a great question. I don't. I have to say, yeah, I don't just know the answer. Kind of conjecture. I'll have to look now that you raise it. That's a really about great question. That, but you know, the the other thing that I, I think is important here, right? Uh, which yeah. you might call scientifically precise and fair quality measures. We we talked earlier with ESG about mm -hmm. how they may guide us to do better things for society. But the other thing is. Expertise is under so much criticism now. And when you're doing false rituals, quantitative rituals of expertise yeah. that aren't really expert or science, or when you're bailing out the too big to fail guys and pretending like that's all okay or necessary, you're, you're destroying the credibility of governance and of expertise and of the institutions like Moody's and S&P and others that accompany or complement that process, that demoralizes the public. That's part of what fans the flames and builds the kind of things like January 6th. And I'm not trying to draw too tight a connection, but the process of integrity really matters. No, listen, you are, you are drawing the right inferences because I think that... Uh, scientific analysis you know however you think about it uh has been under attack and this idea that institutions are somehow doing nefarious work um, is because these institutions have to do a better job of transparency and that's the one thing that we believe in and and first of all i think it was under assault because mm -hmm. Uh, Trump didn't like the 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 uh, results. That's why it was under assault. We need to all understand that. But I also think that many of these institutions, and I'll, I'll fault Moody's and S&P in particular, uh, because there's this notion that that you didn't have to be transparent. You didn't have to tell, you know, you didn't have to show your work. As I used to have a teacher that always said, show your work. Uh, because, you, you know, you're Moody's and S&P, you're licensed by the SEC. They, people have to listen to you. Well, you know what? They don't have to listen to you. We built our company based on going out and talking mm -hmm. to investors. Everything in the world is not black and white. There's a huge gray area, particularly in the financial landscape. And the gray area is messy and it requires work. And you've got to go out and you've got to get a hundred opinions and you've got to t bring those opinions back. You have to synthesize them, but you're going to come out with a more enlightened viewpoint that is transparent and people are going to believe you because you've gone through that hard mm -hmm. process. And that's what we've done. And that's what mm -hmm. I encourage all of our competitors to do. In fact, I encourage all institutions to do that. The, this idea that you can get away with it's this way because mm -hmm. it's always been this way and because we're telling you it's this yes. way. It's not going to cut it. The, the, these young people today, they don't buy into that. They, they want to see the facts. They want to see how you arrived at your conclusion. And we have to be better about doing that. It's, it's, I think it's one of, the, they, one of the strongest things that we've done. It's one of the reasons that we have such a strong connection to our investors that we service. And I think it's one of the reasons that we've been able to build our company 
so quickly is that we have spent the time and we continue to spend the time. I mentioned it before when it, talking about ESG. It's hard work. The gray area, the messy part of every problem is always hard work. And that's where we thrive. That's where KBRA really shows what we're made of. And that's what we've really got to change. We've got to have mm -hmm. we've got to have investors that are demanding that of everybody in the financial uh, market that we demand that you that you that you show transparency, that you show us how you came to that conclusion. And that, as, as you said, that makes things then 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 they're blind to these ain't, you know, these antiquated thoughts that have sort of crept in to the way that we look at things, because when you have to show your work, you can't yeah. have a bias one way or the other. If the work doesn't prove it, you can't have a bias. And so I think that transparency is going to be the, the, the disinfectant yeah. that we need throughout the, the market. And that's well, really what KBRA is all because... about is this what idea of showing your work of transparency. Is providing a better service as a private sector entity to your customers. That's a good thing. But it has something like an ESG-like side effect, which that is, is if thing. the young people in this world see examples, like you're describing your firm as, as how do you say, aspiring to be, then the notion that expertise isn't just a ritual in marketing for power or for whatever agenda, but it's actually a public good, it helps improve the faith and the integrity of our system. And I think, I think that's in very short, that faith and integrity is in very short supply right now. And so you're, it, it, so you, you're kind of doing well I think for your customers on, uh, and doing good for a rebooting of, for our society. I think these are very, very important concepts in expertise, whether you call it elite brand names or degrees or whatever, are being laughed at on social media. And there's something wrong, there's something dangerous about that. But the idea, right. yeah, it's very dangerous because then how would I say? There, there is something dangerous. It's like driving the ship without a rudder. So I, I, I don't know. Right. right. Well, and it's why, you know, it's how you get away with making outrageous claims that you can't support. Um, it's because you get the, the, you know, you get your, your customers so numb to not, not, seeing the how you came to your mm -hmm. conclusions or how you the expertise that that people then start to question everything and that's why i think you're exactly right rob we've got to get back to a time when people can rely on institutions we can rely on expertise and it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we're doing everything in our power to make that to make expertise important again and that, I believe, is through transparency. You know, it's interesting. We, uh, every year, we hire interns and we hire young people. And the, there's been a dramatic change in the last 10 years in the way young people view the, the workforce. They're demanding more of their companies. They, you know, they, they want to know what's your company's view on Black Lives Matter? What's your company's view on Pride Month? What's your company's view on integrity? What do you stand for? And I think that that companies need to think about those things and need to be able to articulate those values in order to not only attract the, the type of, of investors that you want to attract and customers you want to attract, but also to attract people that want to work for your company, that, that see that see themselves in yes. what you're projecting. And so that's a that's a cataclysmic chain. You know, when I started at Price Waterhouse, nobody asked them what their views on racial diversity was. Nobody asked anybody. You were just glad to have a job. You didn't you didn't want to raise your hand. You wanted to do your work and show that you could do your work. 
that that that's not the world we live in today and i think it's a good thing because i think that the the people are 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 becoming stakeholders across the board and they're wanting to be heard and i think that's going to be a real force for good and we're i think learning as a company how to take that really powerful powerful uh in, you know uh viewpoint and then become sort of have that help transform the way that we mm -hmm. uh the way that we I, uh, relate to our customers, my young whether they're investors or whether they're and, issuers. And they say, well, you know, why are you so involved with us? It's now about 16,000 young people. And I said, well, I'm here to mitigate the depth and the duration of your future midlife crisis. <laughs> and I'm, I'm making a joke, but not really, which is the nature of what you've done, because the only <laughs> thing that you have that's really scarce is time. So how do you use your time? And when that. you look back and tell your grandchildren, I have one grandchild yeah. and one on the way in the next couple of weeks. When you get back and you tell them, what did you do? That question of, did I go to a firm where I was proud, not proud to, of the brand name, proud inside of what I saw. And when I used to, that's right. And when I used to uh, teach as an adjunct when I was right. in the hedge fund, proud business, of what they stood uh, for with Soros Fund Management, lots of students at Columbia University would come and want to get what you might call career advice. We'd go out to a local pub or something and look at their resume and talk after class. And I used to say to them, the early part of your career, do not chase money or prestigious brand names. Find a person as a mentor who you would like to be like and an experience that will make you unusual. And that will create an attraction and it will create the skills and the compass that helps you navigate through what Odysseus called the siren songs of temptation. And I think the, I, I just think this, you're, you're, and by the way, it's really awakened now, because when I was talking to those people in the early 90s, I love that, the concerns about environment, the concerns about gender and race were nowhere near as, as heightened as you just described to me. But this is, this is very important for, like I say, mitigating that future midlife crisis, because some of this wisdom, rather than being kind of fast and loose, is very important.